Happy World Seagrass Day. Now, this is an important day for us seagrass lovers to put a spotlight on these amazing ecosystems that are so important for our lives and livelihoods. My name is Peter McCready and I'm a professor of marine science and the founder and director of the Blue Carbon Lab. Richard Unsworth asked me to offer some of my thoughts on the benefits and concerns of seagrass credits. And we're not just talking about blue carbon credits, we're talking about other good things that we get from seagrasses that can be measured and valued. And in Richard's uh, email to me, he pointed out biodiversity and nitrogen, but there are uh, other things too that we might add to this list, such as shoreline stabilization, which is really important for small island nations. You could call that a coastal protection or coastal resilience credit. You could also add to the list uh, fish production credits or biodiversity credits, tourism and recreation credits, cultural credits, and many other possibilities. Carbon, biodiversity, and nitrogen already have credit systems around the world. So these are the credit systems that we can hit go on. Um, but if we are going to innovate in this space and truly recognize the full suite of benefits that humanity derives from seagrass ecosystems, then we also need to be looking to convert some of these other non-market benefits into market benefits, ideally through environmental credits. And doing so will boost the potential for um, stacking of credits and thereby making seagrass conservation and restoration projects more attractive to investors. And I think this will be important because of the high price tag associated with seagrass restoration. Let's face it, it's not cheap to restore a seagrass meadow. Uh, the cost per hectare is sitting pretty high right now. And if you're an investor, you're probably thinking that restoring a terrestrial forest is a safer bet than um, getting carbon or biodiversity credits from seagrasses. Um, hopefully the costs of seagrass restoration will come down as we get better at doing it, but so far it seems a pretty manual process which makes the cost high. Um, it's also risky. Many seagrass restoration attempts have failed. And so this um, credit stacking approach for seagrasses I think is a really good one. And what I like about the seagrass credit approach is that it is a way to access more finance from private sector. I work with many companies that are extractive, so that is they take from nature, and I would love to see these industries being economically incentivized to pivot their companies to instead put back into nature. Um, a world where being nature positive isn't just a trendy thing you talk about to get on the right side of public sentiment, but rather it is actually big business. And this is the carrot approach to incentivizing uh, private sector to invest in nature, but there's also the stick approach, which is outside the scope for today's discussion. But I think we can all agree that the stick approach has failed in many places when it comes to seagrasses. The fact that seagrass ecosystems have been destroyed around the world suggests that the sticks or the regulations aren't doing enough um, to curb seagrass decline. We have the task force for nature-related disclosures and mounting pressure on private sector to take more accountability, which will hopefully lead to some big changes over the coming decades, and it's great to see, but there's more needed. So back to the carrot approach. Uh, the goal here in the seagrass context is to incentivize the conservation and restoration of seagrass ecosystems through a seagrass credit. And I don't know about you, but I'm sick of relying on philanthropic donations and government investment grants to try and pay for the cost of restoration. And don't get me wrong, I really appreciate what's being done in this space, but I would love to see um, increasing uh, finance coming from private sector. And I think it's fair too that the private sector plays this role. Natural capital is a vital asset for the global economy. More than half of global GDP depends on natural resources. Yet as GDP continues to rise over the past 30 years, it's come at the expense of natural capital. Seagrass ecosystems we know have been in decline all around the world due to human activities with an estimated 30% global decline of seagrasses or global loss of seagrasses since the late 1800s and climate change poses an increasing threat. Conservation is significantly underfunded around the world. In Australia, where I'm right now calling from, the conservation gap is conservation finance gap is about 10 billion dollars per annum it seems like a lot of money but to put this into perspective australians spend an estimated 20 billion a year on cosmetic treatments like um, botox fake tanning teeth whitening 
And so the argument here isn't that whether people should be spending their money on wider teeth or a butt lift. The question is, how can we ensure that private sector takes accountability for the impact they have on nature? That is to sort of do their fair share, fair share when it comes to help, helping fix the problem. And also that we find ways to incentivize private sector to be major actors in the global restoration movement, including restoring seagrass meadows. Which brings up another important point. When I say uh, private sector, it's not some distant mob out there that has nothing to do with us. Private sector really is us since I'm mostly talking about consumer driven industries that we're all a part of. Whether it's Botox or whether it's putting petrol in your car or uh, even just owning a phone, we're all a part of it. I'm just digressing a little here, but my point is, I think that we need to find ways to take more accountability for our impacts on nature and to put systems in place to rally finance from private sector for conservation and restoration of nature, including seagrass credits. So if it works for private sector, it boils down to simple economics. And it goes like this, for every dollar you invest in restoring a seagrass meadow, there's a return of more than one dollar. I'm confident that the market is there. I don't think we need to worry about the demand. There's heaps of demand. If I had a bunch of seagrass credits that included carbon, biodiversity and nitrogen, I'm confident that I could sell them in no time. The problem I see is with supply. We're just not generating enough supply. The last time I checked out there, there was a Vera project undergoing registration uh, that was going to generate some, I think it was 40,000 tons of CO2 abatement. This was in Virginia, in the United States of America. Other than that, there doesn't appear to be any other seagrass uh, carbon credit projects registered in any of the mainstream commercial carbon methodologies like Vera or Plan Vivo or CDM. There are some country level carbon credit schemes for seagrasses. Australia has one called BlueCam for tidal reinstatement, which is a model based method that was designed to reduce costs um, of, of running blue carbon projects. And there was another one um, from Japan that was endorsed by uh, uh, Yokohama City that was, it's going to be an interesting one to watch as it seems to be trying to accelerate voluntary market credits with reduced bureaucracy. Um, so what's holding us back from supply? Well, I think there are a few challenges that we need to work through as a community of practice. Number one is our ability to restore seagrass meadows. I really don't think there are many places around the world that can boast having restored seagrass at scale. The biggest to my knowledge of, uh, of restoration of seagrass at scale is the formerly cleared area in Virginia, and I'm referring to the work that was done over the past 20 years with um, VIMS and TNC, the Nature Conservancy, they restored, I think it was some 3,600 hectares. I got to see it myself and it was certainly very impressive. But most of the other projects we're seeing for seagrass restoration tend to be quite small in the order of sort of 10 or so hectares. And that's fine for demonstration projects, but for this to really take off, we need scale. Um, we need that scale so that we're gonna have meaningful impact. The second challenge, I think, is an extension of the previous, which is our ability to restore seagrass meadows in a way that is cost effective. The median cost for restoring seagrass meadows is something like 100,000 US dollars per hectare. So let's say you restore a um, 100 hectare uh, seagrass meadow, and then you're gonna need $10 million. And let's say you get five carbon credits per hectare per annum, then over a 25 year period, I've worked out that you need to sell your carbon credits from seagrass for about $800 each, which is really high. Um, I think you'd wanna be aiming closer for maybe 50 to $100 as a good price. That's probably what the market might be prepared to pay. In which case you'd need to reduce your restoration costs, I've worked out, to about six to $12,000 per hectare. If any of you can restore a seagrass meadow at that price, I'd love to know. And the third challenge is finding a way to do seagrass crediting in a way that balances cost effectiveness, which really affects the uptake by the market against integrity. So many carbon crediting methodologies or just many crediting methodologies in general, they're quite slow and they're bureaucratic 
And as a consequence, we only see these really large projects as being viable. Yet there are many instances where there's lots of smaller projects which could have high value and should go ahead. So if you reduce the number of checks and balances, now here's the risk, if you reduce the number of checks and balances that happen for seagrass crediting, then you also create the risk, oh, you're gonna create higher potential for dodgy behavior. So there's the risk, which is why uh, it is about getting that balance right. So what innovations could there be in developing um, seagrass carbon crediting or just general carbon crediting schemes that reduces the barriers to participation, but still maintains a good amount of, account of accountability. My opinion, take it or leave it, I think is that we uh, would do well to use uh, model-based methodologies combined with blockchain-based platforms for carbon uh, credit tracking and trading, or any, I keep saying carbon, but any um, seagrass credit system, along with third-party auditing, where I think we should take advantage of a remote sensing. Um, this is something I've been giving a great deal of thought to, and if any of you have a site and you're confident that you can restore and would like to pile an idea like this, please get in touch to myself or uh, to, to Richard from um, Project Seagrass. And the fourth and final challenge I would like to pose is to do with governance and equitable sharing of benefits when it comes to seagrass credits. We know that a lot of seagrass restoration is gonna happen in places where there are many potential stakeholders who could potentially claim carbon rights or any other seagrass credit rights. How do we ensure equitable sharing of benefits? And I, I won't get into this because I think it's a very country and region specific question, um, but just that that's something we need to be mindful of. Well, I, I think I'll leave it there. Um, thanks for Rich and the progress, the Project Seagrass team for putting together this webinar and the panel discussion, and I thank you for listening. And I'm very keen to culture more engagement on this topic. I think we're at a really exciting time with Seagrass credits, and uh, we need to be uh, working together to bust through uh, these barriers to making it happen. So. Um, Happy World Seagrass Day.